Welcome to our 33rd lecture in combinatorics. During our previous lecture, we discussed the Moore bound and we proved Hoffman singleton theorem. We'll um, briefly recap this, uh, these results before moving on to, to other things. So the Moore bound states that if a graph is deregular, delta regular and it has diameter D, then the number of vertices is bounded from above by this expression one plus delta plus delta times delta minus one plus so on, the last term being delta times delta minus one to the power d minus one. Now, this number is the number of vertices in a rooted delta regular tree of, of uh, depth uh, d. So you can think of uh, having a root at the top, purple vertex here, and it has delta neighbors at the level below it. And each of these delta neighbors are going to have delta minus one distinct neighbors below and so on. So you go on like this for uh, until you reach a, a level D where you will have delta times delta minus one times D minus one vertices. And it's clear that the number of vertices in gamma subject to these restrictions of regularity and diameter cannot be more than the number of vertices in this uh, purple tree, which is the right hand side expression. Now Moore also asked the question, when do you get when does one get equality in this bound? And we've seen before that for diameter D equals one, the complete graph K delta plus one gives us equality. So that's pretty simple. And then in 1960, Hoffman and Singleton uh, set out to study this problem for diameter two. And in that case, the more bound, so the right-hand side of the inequality on the top is delta square plus one. And Hoffman and Singleton used uh, uh, algebraic methods involving the eigenvalues of the, uh, of the graphs, of the adjacency matrices of graphs, to prove that if gamma is a delta regular graph of diameter two with delta square plus one vertices, then delta uh, must be two, three, seven, or 57. Now, um, when delta equals two, there is a unique graph uh, satisfying these properties, and that's the cycle C5. And that's not too hard to see. A little bit more work uh, uh, one has to do to figure out when, what happens when, when delta equals three. So in that case, um, we can think of, uh, we can try to construct a graph that has uh, 10 vertices, it is three regular and it has diameter two and it attain, so, uh, attains this, this more bound. So, the structure of the graph from a vertex is the one in, in the picture there. So you have a vertex on the top and it has three neighbors. And now because we attain the more bound, we cannot have any edges between these neighbors. So there are no edges there, no triangles in this graph. And also on the next level, we have each vertex has two, uh, each, each neighbor of the vertex on the top has two neighbors below it. And again, we cannot have any any of these vertices at distance two from the one on the top being equal uh, because that we wouldn't reach the, the more bound. So there are no, no C4s. And now the graph must be three regular. So it's a matter of, um, of gluing the pieces at the bottom. So if we take a, a vertex here, uh, it cannot be adjacent to, to, to that one there because that would be a triangle. So let's say it's adjacent to a vertex here. Now this vertex, cannot be adjacent to the one next to it, because again, it gives us a triangle. And it cannot be adjacent to the one back here, because in that case, we would get a cycle C4. So the only choice for its leftover neighbor is to, to go in, in this branch to the right. And you can just pick one vertex here, that one. And now pretty much the structure is, um, uh, follows from, from this procedure because this vertex that we, uh, where we end up now on the right must have one more neighbor. It cannot be the neighbor to the right because of uh, a triangle. It cannot be this one here because of a C4. So it has to be the one here. And similarly, this adjacent here, adjacent here, and then adjacent all the way back. So at the bottom, what we have, we have a cycle in blue cycle C6. And it turns out that this graph is actually the same as, uh, as the Peterson graph. And I leave that to you as an exercise. One way to do that is 
this is the structure of, of, this, uh, of this graph when delta equals three. And you can try to draw the, the Peterson graph if you want. And the Peterson graph, um, so I'll write it here. The vertices are, you can put them as two subsets of a set with five elements, and two of them are adjacent. X is adjacent to Y, if and only if uh, X and Y are, uh, are disjoint. So with that in mind, we can try to draw the picture of a Peterson graph from, uh, from a vertex. We can label this one, two, so I'll just write the two subsets in this notation, three, four, three, five, four, five. And we can put here one, five, two, five, two, four, one, four, one, three, two, three. And we can join them this way. And so with that in mind, you can, you can get an isomorphism between the, the purple and blue graph there and the Peterson graph. And that would, show, uh, that would show uniqueness. Okay, so delta equals two, delta equals three are taken care of. What, what happens with, uh, with delta equals uh, seven and 57? Well, when delta equals seven in the same paper, Hoffman and Singleton, constructed a seven regular graph on 50 vertices, which is seven square plus one, having diameter two. And they also prove that this graph is unique. So their strategy in, in the proof was to do something similar as we did for, for the Peterson graph. You start with a vertex where your graph is kind of rooted and it has seven uh, neighbors below it. So we have a vertex on the top. We have delta equals seven vertices here. And now each one of these uh, neighbors must have six neighbors below. So here below we'll have delta times delta minus one, which is 42. So they will be grouped in this, uh, they will be partitioned into these groups of, uh, of six vertices, six, six. And, so on. and then between any two of these blobs of uh, six vertices, it has to be a perfect matching. And Hoffman and Singleton uh, analyze and they use some uh, combinatorial and algebraic properties of this graph. And they prove that the graph at the, the bottom has to be essentially unique. It's a type of a distance regular graph, which we haven't discussed yet. But anyways, they did uh, this, uh, uh, they use a combinatorial and algebraic method to, to, to construct this graph and to prove that is unique. These days, there are other constructions of the Hoffman singleton graph, which obviously give the same, same graph. Um, and uh, one construction, which is, uh, uh, due to Neil Robertson is the following. You take, uh, consider um, five uh, C5s, uh, let's call them pentagons. So you draw them in the way we draw pentagons. And if the vertices in here can be identified with the uh, partition product Z5 times Z5. And here we have, uh, so um, here we'll have a zero star. So the star can be anything from uh, Z5, here one star, so on, and here it's four star. And if we are in one of these uh, C5s, we have that uh, the vertex IJ is adjacent with the vertex ij plus one. So this is the vertex j in 
in the ith copy of, uh, of C5 is adjacent to the vertex uh, J plus one in the same in the same copy. And now below it, we have five uh, C5s, but um, but drawn in a complementary fashion. So let's call them pentagrams. So they're drawn like this. And the vertices here are also uh, order pair Z5 times Z5, but we put a prime after it. And so we have here zero star prime, one star prime, four star prime. And in this uh, uh, purple uh, uh, C5s, we have that the jth vertex uh, in the i uh, C5, so ij prime is adjacent to i j plus two prime. So that, okay, doesn't give us yet the, the Hoffman singleton graph. So this gives us, uh, you know, 10 copies of C5s, five red and five purple. And in addition to this, um, there's the way to connect. If you pick a vertex uh, on the top, let's call it i k, it will be adjacent to vertices uh, at, on, on these purple vertices as follows. For So i k will be adjacent to things of the form j, let me draw them in purple, i j plus k prime. So this happens for every i j k in z5. Okay, so one have to prove that this is actually an undirected graph because you have this the way I define it. I define the neighbors of a, of a red vertex. So, but anyway, that's not too complicated. And uh, so clearly we have um, 25, uh, 25 red vertices and 25 purple vertices. So 50 vertices. And one has to prove that uh, uh, this graph is actually, it has, uh, is seven regular. So it has to be proved that this is a seven regular graph and the diameter D is two. So that between any two, any two vertices uh, in this graph, uh, if these vertices are not adjacent, you can find a path of length two. Actually, it's a unique path of length two. So I'll leave this as, a, as an exercise for you uh, to, uh, to do. Now, before I tell you about a uh, few things I know about the Delta equals 57 situation, let's look a little uh, quick, uh, quickly, look at these uh, two, three, seven cases. So Delta equals two, you have C5 as the extremal graph attaining equality in the Moore graph. And this is a symmetric, uh, very symmetric uh, graph. And if you look at its automorphism group, it's a, it's a dihedral group with uh, 10 elements. So it has, the automorphism group has, uh, has 10 elements. So it's a very, very symmetric group. Now for Delta equals three, Peterson graph, this is uh, uh, less trivial than C5, but and I won't prove it here, but the automorphism group of the Peterson graph has 120 elements. It's the symmetric group on, on five elements. And for delta equals seven, the automorphism group is a more complicated, but has been determined and its cardinality is, uh, is very large, is 252,000, okay? So all these graphs are very symmetric, very beautiful graphs. Now, in the case of delta equals 57, let's just start by saying that uh, the existence of such a graph, 57 regular graphs, 
on 57 square plus one, which is 3,250 vertices, having diameter two is unknown. So this is an open problem. One of the uh, most famous uh, open problems in, in algebraic and graph theory and combinatorics in general. And uh, there are some people I know that believe such a graph exists, and there are some people that uh, think such a graph doesn't exist. Uh, one thing is known that if such a graph exists, its automorphism group would have to be very small. And I think in Mackay and Shiran in 2010 proved that the automorphism group, the size of it would be at most 375. It's likely that this has been improved since then, but again, you have a graph on 3000 or more vertices and um, its automorphism group is, is, is quite small. So that's, uh, that's what I wanted to say about this part. Now, let's move on. And uh, I want to, to tell you some other applications of eigenvalue methods and algebraic methods that can be done with, uh, with bare hands, essentially, and can produce uh, quite, uh, quite uh, impressive results. And one such result is what is called the sensitivity conjecture. So the sensitivity conjecture has something to do with uh, Boolean functions. And so it's a important conjecture from 1992, I think, in uh, theoretical computer science. I will give you first the uh, its formulation in terms of, uh, of graph theory. And then at the end of the lecture, I can discuss a little bit about, uh, you know, why is it called sensitivity conjecture? What it has to do with uh, uh, you know, the way it appears from uh, questions in, uh, involving Boolean functions in computer science. So the form of the sensitivity conjecture that I'll discuss is the following. Um, so it involves the, the n-dimensional cube. So recall that Qn is the n-dimensional cube. And the vertices of it are the words of uh, length n over the binary alphabet 0, 1, so 0, 1, n times. And the edges there are, you put an edge between the word x1, xn, and the word y1, a, yn. If and only if the Hamming distance, so the number of positions right, like this between x and y is one, which is the same thing as there exists a unique j uh, between one and n. where xj is not equal to yj and xl um, equals yl for every other l. So that's the n-dimensional cube. And so that's one way of, uh, of constructing it. And this is very useful because it immediately implies that this property that qn is uh, n-regular connected and bipartite graph. Okay, so how does that work? Well, the n regular part, if we have a vertex X, um, the neighbors of it 
for each j between one and n, uh, flipping xj to one minus xj produces a neighbor of x. So the neighbor we leave all the bits the same, g minus one, and you just flip xj to one minus xj, and that gives a, a neighbor of x, and all the neighbors have to occur uh, in this fashion, so you get n of them, okay, in regular. Now, qn is connected, because if you take uh, x1, xn, and you take y1, yn, the way to, to get from this node to this node is to try to reduce the number of positions in which in which they this, uh, these uh, two vertices are different. So um, let's say the first position um, in which they're different is, I don't know, x5 is different from y5. So you put here a neighbor in which you have everything up to x4, but here you flip uh, the x5. So you flip it and it changes to y5. So on. So now the number of positions in which this new vertex and the vertex y uh, differ is smaller, and now you repeat the procedure. So eventually you 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 shrink this. Uh, so the distance uh, between x and y. Well, you you shrink then the uh, number of uh, of positions j in which x j is different from y j. And so that essentially constructs you a path from, from X to Y. And that proves that uh, the graph is connected. You can actually, with this argument, you can actually prove that um, the diameter of QN is N. Uh, and essentially, and actually every vertex has exactly one antipodal vertex. So one vertex that is at exactly the distance equal to the diameter which is n from it. So just think about what would be the antipodal vertex of zero, zero, zero. Okay. And now bipartite, so this is a, another important property. To prove that it's bipartite, you have to um, partition the vertex set of this, this graph into two uh, independent sets. And here the partition is the following. You put into one part, the vertice is x, uh, whose weight of x is even. And by the weight, weight of x is the number of j's such that xj equals one. Okay, so zero, zero, zero is there. Everything that has two ones, everything that has four ones and so on. And then you put, in the remaining part, you put the vertices uh, y, such that weight of y is odd. So you would have one, zero, 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 and so on. Um, now, depending if n is odd and even, the all one um, vector or vertex would be, could be in the light blue or the dark blue vertex. Okay, so this is clearly a partition because if you look at the weight of a, of a vertex, it can either be, uh, it's, it's a, a non-negative integer, so it's an integer between zero and n, and it can either be even or odd. So that's a partition. But now why there are no edges? Well, it follows inside this, this part. Well, if you have, uh, if you have uh, two vertices, let's say A adjacent to B, That means that uh, the difference, you can put it this way, the weight of A is congruent uh, this way. The difference between the weight of A and the weight of B, absolute value is one. 
So it could be that A has more ones than B or B has more ones than A, but in either case, the vertex that has more ones has exactly one more one than the other one. And so if, um, so the difference in the weights between, between two adjacent vertices equals one, and that implies that uh, the weight of A and the weight of B cannot have the same parity. So therefore, you will have no, no edges here. Like if I have one, one, zero, 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 there are no edges between them, but you have, you could have edges between the two parts, obviously. So you can have one, 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 adjacent to one, zero. All right, so this is the uh, n-dimensional cube. And the sensitivity conjecture statement is the following. So let n be a natural number if S is a subset of Qn having two to the n minus one plus one vertices, then the subgraph of Qn induced by S has maximum degree of the least square root of n. And here, if you put the least square root of n, and it's a degree which is a, a natural number, you can put a ceiling, but we'll just leave it at least the square root of n. Okay. All right. So let's just see some examples to see how, how this works out. So when, um, okay, what is about two to the n minus one? Well, before we had this picture of, uh, of qn, in which uh, you have here even, let's say words. So the ones with WX is even. And here we have odd words or vectors. These ones are odd. And now the graph, so the graph is bipartite and is regular. So each vertex from here has, only has neighbors across and each vertex on the right only has neighbors the other side. So, um, you know, it follows from this that, uh, or from counting number of even words and odd words, that the number of vertices on, on the left is going to be two to the n minus one. The number of vertices on the right is also two to the n minus one. So we have, this is a bipartite graph, which has two to the n minus one vertices on the left and two to the n minus one vertices on the right. And so this number here, if you look at, uh, at this number in the theorem, two to the n minus one plus one, if this plus one wouldn't be there, then this result would definitely not be true because in that situation, we could pick all the vertices in, on one side of the uh, partition, so all the vertices in light blue or dark blue, and we would have two to the n minus one um, uh, vertices there, and there will be no edges there, no edges between them. So the maximum uh, degree would be would be zero. It wouldn't be square root of n. But the result says that if we pick one more, so if we put, pick two to the n minus one plus one vertices then we're guaranteed to, to have chosen among uh, these, uh, these vertices, one that's adjacent to at least square root of n other, other vertices. Okay. Now, so again, these uh, the two remarks are that two to the n minus one plus one is best possible in the sense that uh, cannot be decreased to two to the n minus one, okay? And it follows from work of uh, 
some famous mathematicians, uh, Fam Chung, Earth and Purity, Ron Graham, and Paul Seymour, also from around the 1990s, that uh, there exists uh, an induced subgraph, um, let's call it gamma of Qn with two to the n minus one plus one vertices having the maximum degree of this gamma equals to square root of n. So this is when n is a, is a perfect square. Okay, so there's a construction uh, of, of such a such a set. Now the record before the result that I'll state in a second. So also, um, so the best result until recently uh, was also proved by uh, by Chung, Fury, Gra uh, Graham, and Seymour, and they they had a lower bound. So on this maximum degree of log log n. Okay. Now the result that I'll tell you about is now a theorem and is a theorem due to a brilliant uh, mathematician named Hao Huang. In 2019 proved sensitivity conjecture. And I hope to give you the, the gist of the idea of, uh, of his proof in the, in the remaining uh, 20 minutes. Okay, so if you start, uh, so I gave you one construction of the, of uh, the n-dimensional cube using the uh, uh, words of uh, length n or over a binary alphabet adjacent if and only if they differ in exactly one position. There's another construction you can you can do. There's another way to build the QN as follows. So you can start with Q1, which is 0, 1. That's the, the Q1. And now what you can do is, uh, let me see if my lasso works. You can, uh, it definitely works. I forgot how to copy and paste. So if you want to do a Q2, what you do is take two copies of Q1. So I have a zero and one, just copying them zero and one. And now for the first copy, append the zero to beginning or end, let's say to the end. I put a zero here, I put a zero. And to the other, a copy append a one to the end, a one like this, and then add uh, some new edges between these twin vertices. So the one on the top you add like this, and the one in the bottom you add like this. Okay, so that's Q2. And now, if I want to build a, a Q3, I can do a similar similar argument. Now I have I take two copies of Q2. Uh, so I have here 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. And I have 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1. And similarly as before, I add a 0 to the end of the vertices on the left. I add a 1 to the end of the vertices on the right. And then I join these twin vertices. Uh, uh, I Put also one there. I should have put a one. Okay. Zero. One. 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 And now you add a purple edges here. This. That's one. Okay. So in general, uh, QN, you will have a copy of QN minus one here. Um, and we'll have a copy of QN minus one here. And then uh, we have this perfect matching between them like this. Okay, here you have a word star, star, star that ends 
a zero. And on the other half, you have star, star, star. It ends with the one, uh, with the one. Okay. So now this is uh, uh, quite useful. And if I look now at the adjacency matrix of the graph, so the adjacency matrix of the graph QN, if I label my vertices first to start with the ones on the left that have a zero at the end, it will look in this block form. I will have an adjacency matrix of QN minus one here. Then between them, I have a perfect matching, which is corresponds to an identity matrix of order two to the N minus one. It's transpose here, which is the same. And here I have adjacency matrix of Q n minus one. So that's one way that you can build recursively the adjacency matrix of, uh, of the n dimensional Q. And this can be used in many ways. And one way you can, you can use it is that, so, you can get the spectrum of this. So I have a q n minus one, i two n minus one. So if I have a, a, a if I have an eigenvector for the n minus one dimensional cube. So a q n minus one u equals lambda times u. Okay. Then, so if I think about it in terms of the graph here, I have q n minus one, q n minus one, and here I have this. Like I can create um, actually two eigenvectors for the. for the QN graph as follows. So one way, I will just copy the U here and I will copy the U, U here. And that will give me that A of QN times this vector U, U like this. This will equal Um, this will be lambda plus one times u. And I can do a similar trick here. And I have a qn minus one, qn minus one. I have these edges in between. I can put a u here and I can put a minus u on the other side. And that will get me a qn times u minus u equals lambda minus one u. Okay. So you can show that if you if the u's from qn minus one form a, a, a orthogonal or orthonormal basis for, for r to the power two to the n minus one, these, these uh, vectors below will also give you a, a basis for r uh, two to the n. And so you get the spectrum of the whole graph. And um, this can be done recursively starting with Q1. So Q1 uh, has eigenvalues one with multiplicity one and minus one with multiplicity one because Q1 is just uh, um, one edge. And by this argument, this one from there can give you for Q2, can give us one plus one. So it give us a two multiplicity one, it give us a zero. The minus one plus one gives us a zero, and then so it gives us a minus two with multiplicity one. So we get a zero here with multiplicity two. And you can continue like this Q3, this gives you three multiplicity one. Then if you go to one, um, we have a one from here. Uh, and then from these two zeros, we also can get get the one. So together we have a one with multiplicity one, one multiplicity two. So you get one multiplicity three. You get a minus one multiplicity two. Minus two gives you a minus one multiplicity one. So you get the minus one multiplicity three. And it gives you minus three with multiplicity one. And so on. So essentially QN 
as eigenvalues uh, n minus 2j for j between 0 and, uh, and n with multiplicity n choose j minus n choose j minus 1, where n choose minus 1 is 0. So that's what we can do. So these are the eigenvalues, OK? Now, what uh, Hao Huang did, so this is the usual adjacency matrix. So Hao Huang constructed a zero plus one minus one, it's called signed adjacency matrix of QN. Uh, let's call it HN such that hn square equals n times i to the 2a. So you see the eigenvalues of the usual adjacency matrix are n, n minus 2, and so on, going all the way to minus n. Now, if you change some of the ones to minus ones, uh, Huang uh, constructing this uh, sine adjacency matrix, which has the property that hn square is n uh, times identity, which means that hn has eigenvalues, square root of n minus square root of n, each with multiplicity two to the n minus one. So again, uh, a sine adjacency matrix uh, is a matrix in which we take the original adjacency matrix and we change some, possibly none, but we change some ones to minus one such that the matrix stays uh, symmetric. Okay. So you can imagine that you have many sign adjacency matrices because you could change many, many ones to, to minus ones. So here's the construction of Hao Hong. So it's recursive and is as follows. H1 is the original. This is the same as the adjacency matrix of Q1. This is a two by two matrix. And then for N greater or equal to two, HN is HN minus one. It's a block form identity identity and here it's minus h and minus one so this is almost the same as the adjacency matrix so remember that the adjacency matrix of qn was this form here it was with a q n minus one so in th this is the block where things change. And using induction on N, so by induction on N, it's actually quite easy to prove that HN square equals N times I to the two N minus one. If you know that HN min N minus one satisfy this property, you just, raise h and to the power two and uh, it follows very quickly. Okay. So now, okay, so we have this sine adjacency matrix. So coming back to the, to the sensitivity conjecture, so let's say gamma is um, so let's say S is a subset of QN, cardinality of S equals two to the N minus one plus one. Okay. Now let's say gamma is the subgraph of QN induced by S. So if we look at the, this matrix that we have HN, so the rows and the columns correspond to the, to the vertices of the graph. And some of them are, gonna are going to correspond to the vertices in S. And in my picture, for example, I just put, put the first vertices here to correspond to the, to the ones in S, but it doesn't have to be like that. Um, the because uh, so if you take the rows 
So AS is the principal submatrix of HN corresponding to the rows to the to the vertices of S. Okay. And now here's a, the, the trick. So what we have is that AS minus square root of N identity of uh, cardinal T of S. So AS minus a multiple of the all one matrix. Uh, this is a, so AS minus square root of N identity is a principle some matrix of HN minus square root of N I to N. But now what do we know about, uh, about HN? HN has eigenvalues square root of N minus square root of N with multiplicity two to the N minus one. Okay. So we have a principal sum matrix of it. So because of that, the rank of AS minus square root of N identity is less than or equal than the rank of HN minus square root of N I to N to, to N. But if HN has eigenvalues square root of N and minus square root of N, HN minus um, square root of N I two to the N has eigenvalues zeros and minus two square root of N. And so each of them will multiplicity two to the N minus one. So these, uh, the rank will be two to the N minus one. Okay. So what we got is that the rank of this matrix AS minus square root of N I S is less than or equal than two to the n minus one. Okay. But what did we know about S? Cardinality of S is two to the n minus one plus one. So it's this two to the n minus one. So this matrix, this matrix AS minus square root of n i until S is a two to the n minus one matrix. But its rank is less than two to the n minus one. So that implies that AS minus square root of n I cardinal D of S is singular. So that implies that square root of n is an eigenvalue. Okay. And that implies that the largest eigenvalue of, of this AS is greater or equal than square root of n. So what we get now, we have that the largest eigenvalue of, uh, of the sign adjacency matrix is at least square root, square root of n. Okay. But in our, uh, the conjecture is about the maximum degree. Okay. But it's not too hard to see. So um, so we have uh, gamma is a subgraph of Qn induced by S. And we have that this largest eigenvalue of this sign adjacency matrix is greater or equal to square root of N. So what we do is uh, we write down the eigenvalue eigenvector equation. So we have a s times some some vector, let's call it w, equals uh, lambda one 
as times the vector w. And, um, and then that gives us the lambda one, which is right lambda one as in wj equals summation over all uh, L um, adjacent to J of AS JL W. Okay. And if we take J such that WJ is maximum over all Ws, uh, all WI, I in S, then this equation on the right hand side is going to be less than or equal then what is going to be less than or equal than the summation of L in J, uh, L adjacent to J of, uh, of WL. And this is at most the maximum degree uh, of, of gamma times W, WJ. And we can take this WJ to be positive. And when you divide by WJ here, one gets that delta of gamma is greater or equal than lambda one of AS, which is greater or equal than square root of. And this finishes the proof of the sensitivity conjecture.